Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Peeler. I'm the executive director of the Infectious Disease Society of America Foundation. Today, I'm happy to welcome you to our talk, HIV Speaks, History, Healing, and Hope. This is the second webinar as a part of our John G. Bartlett education series. This series is a collection of infectious disease lectures from industry experts and patients, as well as other subject matter experts in our field. We will have pre-recorded videos from Dr. Bartlett himself for some of our upcoming events. These lectures honor the groundbreaking work and thought leadership of Dr. Bartlett. He was a pioneer in infectious diseases whose mentorship inspired many. On behalf of all of us at the IDSA Foundation, we'd like to extend a sincere welcome to our presenters today who volunteered their time to speak about HIV research and their personal experience with the disease. We're grateful to have their support in this exciting event. And to those of you watching, we wanna thank you as well. We hope that this talk will create positive impact in the work of HIV, prevention, and patient care. As you may know, December is HIV AIDS Awareness Month, and it brings together the attention to a disease that has affected many people around the world, as well as, of course, the United States. For more than 40 years, through this event, we will bring new insights to the table through the perspective of our experts, in the field, as well as those who have experienced the disease firsthand. This education, John Bartlett Education Series has been brought to us and to you today with the generous support of an educational grant from Saris Therapeutics. First, we would like to hear from Dr. Dahl Hewlett Jr., who will discuss the first identification of HIV in the United States more than four decades ago. He will provide insight into advancements in treatment that have dramatically improved the quality of life for those living with HIV. Dr. Hewlett. Good afternoon, and it's an honor to be asked to take part in this program this afternoon, uh, commemorating the 40th anniversary of uh, HIV, uh, and also importantly, commemorating the work of Dr. John G. Bartlett. Uh, we cannot mention HIV and talk about a commemoration in HIV without recognizing the great work that Dr. Bartlett did. When I was an ID fellow here in the Bronx, New York, back in the early 1980s, I remember being introduced to patients who had disorders that we could not figure out. And we later found that they actually had HIV. At that time, we didn't know the causative agent. Uh, however, very quickly, with the collaboration and cooperation of academic centers, researchers, the government, uh, and uh, commercial entities, we were able to determine that this was indeed a retrovirus that was causing this. And so by 1983, 1984, we knew that this was caused by HTLV, HTLV3, as we called it then, and now we call it HIV. We found that there were a number of groups who were most impacted by this uh, infection. We found that individuals who were gay, we found individuals who were uh, using parenteral drugs, uh, individuals who were recipients of transfusions, and infants who were born to mothers who might fall into certain risk categories. We were faced with a challenge. We didn't actually have a treatment. A very bright spot in my career occurred in uh, 1994, when the drug AZT or, or Zidovudine was discovered to have a beneficial impact in decreasing the mother to child transmission. And we worked as a team here in New York, and I'm sure the same occurred in other parts of the country to try to mobilize and to put together an infrastructure in our public and private hospitals 
so that we would be able to make sure that all of the mothers who were HIV positive would receive treatment and that their newborns would also receive treatment. And we knew that this treatment would actually decrease the transmission of HIV by about 67%. When we look now specifically at Dr. Bartlett, and I think that it's important for us to look at Dr. Bartlett, not only for the work that he did in HIV while he was at Johns Hopkins, but also for his vision, because his vision, I think, will lay the groundwork for us in the field of infectious diseases as we approach future challenges. You may not be aware of this, but in 2008, Dr. Bartlett and his colleague, Dr. Borio, uh, wrote a position paper, and it was entitled, The Current Status of Planning for Pandemics. And uh, he basically stated that the US needs to be better prepared for a large scale medical catastrophe, whether, whether it would be a natural disaster, bioterrorism, or a pandemic. So he was predicting in 2008, almost 12 years to the day, what was going to be happening in 2020 when we are faced with COVID. And he basically stated that the harsh realities are that the US healthcare system is a private competitive system, it's broken, and it's working at capacity so that any demand for surge cannot be met with the existing economic resources, hospital beds, manpower, or supplies. And that is the challenge that we are facing in infectious diseases today. Dr. Bartlett came to Johns Hopkins University uh, School of Medicine in 1980, and he became the chief of infectious diseases there. And this was essentially the the time when HIV was first starting to come on the scene. He devoted uh, much of his 26 year career at Hopkins to HIV care, and he was very innovative. And if we look at that model that he put together when he started, there were three full-time faculty members at Johns Hopkins in the field in the area of infectious diseases. And when he left in 2006, there were 55 faculty, full-time faculty members and they were performing over 5,000 visits per year. Uh, he developed dedicated HIV services. He also developed HIV and hepatitis services, as well as services related to tuberculosis. So as we move forward, we are going to be facing challenges, and certainly in our field of infectious diseases, we are facing manpower challenges. It's up to us to follow in the footsteps of Dr. Bartlett as mentors and as teachers, as clinicians, and also as researchers in our field of infectious diseases. We've made great strides in this area, and you will hear more about that in just a moment. But we have gone from a disease that had no treatment back in the 1980s to a disease that became treatable and managed as a chronic disease to a disease now that we can actually prevent. And so I hope that you will be inspired from some of the information that is going to be shared with you uh, later on in this uh, program. So I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hewlett. Uh, thank you for sharing your journey as well as a little background on HIV as well as uh, Dr. Bartlett today. Uh, right now, I'd like to turn the program over to Dr. Wafa El Sadar, and she will give you her perspective uh, of the journey as well. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And um, I very much appreciate this opportunity to be with you all today, and uh, particularly to continue to honor the legacy of Dr. John G. Bartlett, uh, really a giant um, in, in our field, and somebody that uh, many of us. Uh, uh, hold dear and revere, um, and I've always revered and will continue to revere for the future. Uh, when I think back now on the 40th anniversary of the first um, um, US um, AIDS, cases of AIDS that were identified um, um, at that point in time, and I think of uh, what has evolved over the past uh, four, more than four decades, I, I think I marvel uh, at some of the advances that have been accomplished but at the same time we're celebrating these advances, I also have to reflect on some of the gaps that continue to remain 
and some of the challenges that, um, that we also need to face today and as we move forward. Thinking back now 40 years ago, as uh, Dr. Gillis was saying, I was a young uh, infectious disease um, attending physician then in New York City as well in the Harlem community. And I think what I, what I recall are many years, months and years of, of intense pain and suffering and uh, frustration. Um, I think for many of us, uh, we felt in many ways, um, uh, in a way helpless in many ways, because we had so little to offer to our patients beyond offering supportive, the support and the care and the, um, uh, that they needed at that point in time, and also to offer them the support they needed to deal with some of the enormous stigma and discrimination they faced in their day-to-day -day life. These were not easy years. These were very difficult and painful years uh, that were experienced by people living with HIV and also by people who took care of people living with HIV. I think importantly, I think also need to recognize that I'm very proud that the infectious disease community uh, of physicians and trainees was the community that, that really uh, stood up and rose uh, to the occasion and, uh, and took on the, the task of taking care of people living with HIV during those very difficult times. Uh, there were many others in, our, in the medical profession who ran away. Uh, away from HIV and people living with HIV, but I have to say that it was our community of uh, infectious disease uh, specialists and trainees that ran towards these patients, doing everything they could to allay their suffering and to support them during most difficult times. However, I think what also um, evolved and I think was in, has been inspiring are the major advances that have occurred. Uh, firstly, in terms of diagnosis of HIV, uh, the availability of a testing to be able to detect uh, people living with HIV, as well as the evolution of treatment, effective treatment uh, for, for HIV. And again, this was a gradual uh, process with uh, many of us remembering uh, patients having to take handful, uh, a large handful of, of doses of medications uh, four times a day sometimes uh, to be able to achieve uh, the benefits from these medications. And however, we moved on to a point in time where now uh, individuals living with HIV can take one pill a day and that can transform um, uh, their health and well-being. Dr. John G. Bartlett was instrumental in making these advances, both in terms of the discovery of the treatments, uh, the treatment judgments, but also in his uh, critical role in the guidelines, the developing guidelines that really helped us all as practitioners to do the right thing. And that's been very critically important is that he was uh, so astute at uh, helping craft guidelines that made sense, that all of us could look at, could use, synthesize the most recent uh, evidence that was available and give us a step-by-step -step guidance in terms of what to do as we uh, took care of our patients. And that's a, a legacy that is, uh, is durable and continues till today. Uh, with the guidelines that we have available nationally now. As we moved over time, I think the epidemic also evolved and uh, beyond affecting the high resource countries like the US and moved to a massive global pandemic that still goes on to this day. Even in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, we still have as uh, a, a very much a, an HIV pandemic that's uh, that's, uh, that's raging as well. So we have now a moment in history when there's a collision between these two uh, pandemics. And I think in, in many ways, again, um, the, the lessons we learned here in tackling HIV and, and, and responding to the needs of people living with HIV in this country were very informative to me personally and to many of the people I worked with in shaping how we could also bring some of these advances to some of the millions and millions of people who are living with HIV in other less fortunate contexts. Whether these uh, uh, less fortunate contexts were right here in our communities, in our own country, or whether they were in other countries around the world, including primarily in Sub-Saharan Africa. And I have to say that the guidelines that were developed and the knowledge that was developed locally was incredibly um, informative and for us as we um, went to try to, um, uh, to tailor these responses, adapt them to other contexts, and then to start to see and reap the benefits of treatments and notice these benefits and 
be able to celebrate those benefits uh, for uh, the millions of people living with HIV elsewhere. And for me personally, I've, I've treasured the opportunity to work both locally and glo globally, still working here in Harlem in the Bronx, but at the same time also working in more than 30 countries around the world. I'm a believer in terms of how the local can inform the global, but also how the global learnings can also inform and, uh, and, and uh, inform our local response. And I think we have to continue this learning and this openness to uh, taking innovations forward. Mm -hmm. And then I think I need to touch as well on the issue of prevention. It became very evident that um, while we have made the massive advances in treatment, not for everyone, and I'll talk about the gaps shortly, that we had to also focus on prevention, primary prevention. We know that treatment is prevention, and that's why it's critically important for people who are living with HIV to be aware of their status, and to uh, get on treatment and stay on effective treatment. But I think the next challenge for our community faces uh, is the, ch the challenge of prevention. We've known that condoms are really effective at preventing sexual transmission. We also know that the harm reduction is effective in prevention of transmission uh, amongst people who, uh, people who inject drugs. But nonetheless, we were, and we know that there are lots of behavioral interventions that have been shown to work. But I think the, the real progress happened when the identification that treatment worked for prevention by decreasing the viral load, which is very important, but then the advances in primary prevention, and that I'm thinking of uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP, uh, which enabled people who were not HIV infected, who were at risk to be able to take uh, a pill a day. Uh, and that pill, if it's taken according to prescription, then as prescribed to prevent them from acquiring uh, HIV. And that was a, a huge advance in our field. And even more recently, I think we've also identified the now long acting um, uh, PrEP uh, agents, injectable agents that hopefully can be uh, maybe um, uh, authorized soon or approved soon that offer the opportunity of maybe one injection every two months that can be substantially protective uh, to people from acquiring HIV. So I think the advances in both prevention as well as in treatment have been profound. And, um, and that is real cause for celebration. However, we also have to recognize that not everything is rosy and we continue to have, uh, see the impact of continued transmission of HIV in our own country, now affecting mainly subsets of our population, particularly uh, men who are sex with men and other men who are sex with men. Uh, particularly uh, uh, persons of color uh, who seem, who at this point are bearing the brunt of new HIV infections, as well as also disproportionate impact on women of color in our own country. We continue to see also globally large numbers. Now it's estimated that overall there's, even today, there's about 1.7 new HIV infections every year. So we have a long way to go in terms of expanding uh, uh, both treatment as well as also expanding prevention. Now you may say, well, we have the tools, we have the tools in our hand, why are we not able to get to the end of AIDS, which is certainly um, our goal to end AIDS as a global pandemic. And I think it's a realization that there really are no magic bullets. Is that biomedical interventions and biomedical discoveries are enormously uh, amazingly, uh, adva uh, amazing advances and enormous, enormous progress that we are witnessing with the flourishing of these uh, discoveries. But what we have to do is to think beyond that, to think about why are certain populations in our midst, uh, whether they be in this country or around the world, why it has been difficult for them to gain access to these interventions. And some of it are issues that are structural, issues around uh, structural racism, issues around discrimination. Some of them are issues around poverty, lack of information. Uh, some of them are uh, issues around denial and fear of stigma and discrimination. And that tells me that we should not rest on our laurels and think that we have a magic book. What we have to do is to take the tools we have identified and wrap around them the supportive kinds of interventions that allow for an integrated approach that takes into account the priorities as well as the challenges, 
that the people at risk for HIV and people living with HIV face day in, day out. And it is through this recognition that we don't have a magic bullet, that we have to continue to innovate and we have to continue to adapt and we have to continue to make our innovations, to make our discoveries accessible and available uh, to the breadth of the populations that need them in exactly the manner that they need them. So I'm gonna stop here and uh, hand it back to, I think I handed, I'm not sure who I handed back to, but thank you for your attention. I'll take it from here, uh, Dr. El Sadar. Thank you so much uh, for your explanation of the uh, innovative models that are being used today compared to in the yeah. past. Uh, also talking about a multidisciplinary uh, approach. I think that was very informative. Thank you very much. Uh, we definitely appreciate your work behind the scenes as well as Dr. Hewlett uh, in uh, dealing with uh, HIV and HIV patients. Uh, at this time, we'd like to hear from someone who has experience with the disease firsthand. I'd like to introduce you to Harold Scott, also known as uh, Scotty, uh, who is an HIV survivor of uh, 30 years and a wonderful patient advocate. Scotty, I turn it over to you. Thank you. As uh, we've already heard, HIV AIDS has been a part of our lives for the past 40 years perhaps even longer. For me, I have personally lived with the virus for 32 of those years, almost half my life. The virus thought to only affect the larger cities of the United States. There we are. All right, Scotty, we'll, we'll, bring, you, we'll bring you back. Uh, I think that we had, uh, Great conversation with you uh, to now. Dal, would you like to uh, start with uh, some of what we could hear of uh, Scotty and then we'll uh, bring him back, obviously. Uh, maybe you two could uh, talk about how, uh, obviously, uh, that was a very common uh, situation or a common uh, way of acquiring the disease back in the day. Yes, well, well sure. Uh, what Mr. Scott was describing was uh, pretty much what we were facing. That is, this was an unknown. Um, most people had not heard of this. Uh, a lot of the surveys showed that um, people who were outside of uh, a few people who were in the larger cities, uh, most people didn't know anything about this disease at that time. And so this was a fairly typical story. This was what I saw many times in my small practice um, in Yonkers, New York, and also we saw it many times uh, at Lincoln Hospital uh, in the Bronx, which was one of our public hospitals. Uh, and unfortunately, at that time, we did not have a lot that we could offer. However, we rapidly learned that this disease, when it was in its full manifestations, uh, was complicated by infections and we were able to, at least at that time, prevent many of the infections, which um, would put the patients in danger. Mm -hmm. Anything to add there, uh, Dr. Elsa? I think you're on mute. Somebody's on. Um... No. Now, now we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I think when I think back dial of those years, I, I think in many ways, um, and I, I don't know if you agree with this or not, is sometimes the the lack of kind of a effective treatment, the lack of, you know, some biomedical um, uh, at that time effective um, antiretroviral therapy, I think transformed the practice of infectious disease. I think many of us really trained um, in infectious disease and, and thought of our, our future as being kind of more of the traditional hospital consultant type of infectious disease practice. Mm -hmm. And here we were almost overnight challenged with a whole other way of practicing our profession. We moved to becoming really primary care providers uh, for people living with HIV because others did not 
feel like wanted to do this or they didn't know didn't want to do it or didn't know how to do it and uh, it created a, also um, so it became more rather than sort of more the episode, episodic hospital infectious disease consultant services of the past uh, in addition to, of course, continuing to do that, we became also, uh, we had to learn how to become effective primary care providers. And we had to learn, uh, and we also had to learn uh, how to work as a multidisciplinary team. Um, this was a whole new way of practicing medicine. Uh, all of a sudden we realized that it was, you know, what we could do was only part of the answer that we needed that uh, social worker uh, more than ever, we needed to have the uh, the nutritionists on our team. We needed to have the caseworkers. We needed to have the outreach workers, uh, and it, it just it was a realization that there's beauty in medicine that goes beyond kind of the limited uh, practice that we anticipated. That we we it forced us to establish these very deep relationships with our patients, not just as individuals often with these patients and their families and their loved ones. Mm -hmm. And we became a team taking care of families and, 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 and uh, beyond the individual patients sitting in front of us. And I feel that that was a very critical transformation uh, of, the, of the practice of infectious disease. I totally agree. And um, this was something that all of us experienced. And I like to tell some of our colleagues who are coming into practice, although, and it's not specifically related to infectious diseases, that we have to always think about the role of the physician. And uh, Dr. Trudeau uh, expressed this very well many, many years ago when he said, and I can't quote it exactly, but the role of the physician is uh, cure occasionally, uh, improvement often, and comfort always. And so we should always be able to comfort the patient, even though we might not be able to improve their condition or even though we might, be, might not be able to cure it. And I think over the years, we actually witnessed uh, a, a change in our role so that we got to the point where we were able to at least control and we'd like to say cure uh, the disease in most of our patients. Thank you both. I believe we have uh, Scotty back. Let's hope his uh, sound is a little better. We'll go ahead and uh, mute. And we'll uh, check and see if he's uh, back online now. Uh, he's, uh, he's still having a little trouble. All right, so no worries. We will, uh, we will continue uh, with uh, Dial and, uh, and Wafa. What, one of the things yeah. I will ask, yeah. I will ask Dr. El Sadir to uh, comment on. You mentioned needing support. And I think that in the hospitals at that time, our city hospitals, we had, as a result of the work of Dr. Bartlett and others, there were new modalities that were coming onto the scene. And in order to use these new modalities, we had to actually fill out uh, usually reams and reams of paperwork. Um, and we actually lacked support and many times we were reluctant to use some of these new modalities because we didn't think that we would be able to finish all of the paperwork and at the same time take care of all our patients. And maybe you could comment on that because I know that you did that very, very well at, at Harlem Hospital. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, and that's where having a team made a difference. I mean, you recall that in those years we had we, all of us at the city hospitals here. I was at Harlem, you were at Lincoln developed these multidisciplinary teams that then sort of took care of all the patients in the hospital. And we have these weekly meetings and we go through patient by patient and, and identify how they were doing, but more than this, what else did they need? And it was so fundamentally important to have sitting around the table, uh, the, the amazing caseworker, the remarkable family counselor, you know, the, and I think in, in many ways, it was a, what I felt and I continue to feel is that this, there was this and continues the enduring passion in terms of a commitment to doing whatever it took, you know, to, to be able to bring the comfort, to bring the services uh, to these patients and their families. And, uh, and it was also a realization, and that was both inpatient and outpatient. And the realization um, that, I, that dawned on me early on 
was that we had to reach beyond the walls of hospitals and clinics. And that's probably, it was a very important early lesson I learned that has guided my work globally as well, is that we often think is, is that, you know, sitting in a clinic or sitting in a hospital and, uh, and we await whoever comes to us. It's a rather very passive uh, way of thinking about uh, care. Um, and, and it obviously means that we will always be restricted to seeing the tip of the iceberg, the people who found us, you know, and uh, with either, either they came to us because they got sick or they came to us because they utilized one of the services and then they continued with us. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. And, and, and I think we realized that, that if we just focus on this tip of the iceberg, we'll be missing the rest of the iceberg. Then that's when the, the whole partnership with community organizations began. And this, um, the engagement of people living with HIV as peer educators who could reach out to other people in the community because they had the trust of these people and talk to them about HIV and the importance of getting tested and tell them about the services we had. And that allowed us to go beyond the tip of the iceberg to think about what else is happening in the community. Um, and, that, and it was a, an important lesson learned uh, in terms of reaching behind the constraints of the walls of our hospitals and clinics. Yes. And I think those and that, I mean, I, if I think of some of the, the enduring lessons from HIV is that we all, if I can, maybe I'll start counting them and then Dr. Hewlett, you can add, but I would say uh, learning to be humble as a physician, you know, you, uh, you, you are part of a team, learning to develop multidisciplinary team and respect them and, and value the work of a team. Uh, I think number three is learning to go beyond the walls of our clinics and hospitals. And probably number four is the, um, the, the amazing value of, uh, uh, of, uh, of people living with HIV and their commitment mm -hmm. and, and organizations that cater to people living with HIV. Yeah. One of the things I think that is amazing about HIV right now is that if we look at the practice as it exists today, it has gone from where we were in the late 1980s and 1990s to a practice in which it's almost uh, pharmacology, uh, advanced pharmacology, um, where now all of the emphasis is on trying to uh, design regimens for patients that will match with their underlying disease. Uh, so as Dr. Bartlett was uh, was, was engaged in uh, hepatitis C co-infection and HIV, and then looking at tuberculosis patients and HIV. Uh, certainly in the area of prevention, we have to look at all of the underlying disorders that people have. And so it's a totally different uh, situation. And I think that we are all very, very glad, and I am certainly humbled when I look at all of these advances because I realize that it takes a special type of physician with a special type of skill to actually practice uh, HIV medicine. It is really just quite a complex uh, kind of an endeavor. If, yeah, uh, I, I mean, absolutely. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, just no, to add no one worries. Quick Go ahead. Thing, just, sure. Absolutely. I agree with you, but I sometimes worry that, um, you know, mm -hmm. It's true, and the, the treatment has become so sophisticated, and like you said, the pharmacology and, and shaping regimens and so on is so important um, at this point in time. But I worry sometimes that we're again focusing on the tip of the iceberg. We know that, you know, we know that in our communities, people are, and you know this, I'm sure, is that people are still acquiring HIV. We know that sometimes we get those patients who come in with very advanced HIV. Uh, which is tragic in this day and age. Um, and we have to ask ourselves, why is that happening? Why are people not, you know, even though they are at risk and they probably appreciate that some point, to some extent that they're at risk, they're reluctant to get tested, they're fearful, they're afraid of the stigma, they're afraid, you know, and they're in denial. And we, we kind of have to continue to chip away at all of these impediments to get to people who 
still are acquiring HIV and are not benefiting from all these prevention great tools we talked about, as well as people who have living with HIV, but just are reluctant or afraid or don't know where to go. And so I, I feel like that, even though we're, we've become very sophisticated, we need to uh, remember that um, we're still dealing, if we just focus on this, that is the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Very good. I, uh, before we get to some of our uh, panelists' uh, questions for both of you from our audience, I wanted to uh, ask you to, uh, you mentioned healthcare disparities and how it's helped uh, hurting some of the specific uh, communities that uh, you're working within in an urban uh, setting there. Uh, can you, both of you, talk briefly about how uh, healthcare disparities is uh, still uh, evident in HIV uh, treatment of your patients? Please go ahead first. Yeah. Okay. I can speak um, certainly from the role uh, we have here in a health department. Uh, the Westchester County Department of Health actually, um, we have about 1 million people here in Westchester and we border uh, the Bronx, and we have a large population of underserved individuals in many of our communities. Uh, one of the things that we're struggling with right now, and um, were it not for our full engagement with the COVID outbreak, we have been tasked with trying to increase the utilization of our AIDS, um, our AIDS prevention program. Uh, there's an underutilization of these services. With our health department, we actually are offering medications free of charge, mm -hmm. uh, but many people still need to be educated. As Dr. Elsadir was saying, uh, we need to be out in the community. We need to be doing more outreach so that we make people aware of the importance of uh, diagnosis and also not only treatment, but also prevention. And I think a lot of people are not aware of the services that we have. Uh, fortunately, we have received a grant from uh, US Health and Human Services, uh, which is devoted to enhancing um, health literacy. And part of that is to educate people about diseases, not only COVID and the vaccine, but also about HIV, how it can be prevented in some of the services which we have. And so I think that that's one of our big uh, concerns and it's going to be an area of focus for us and uh, certainly uh, we need as much help as we can get in terms of um, getting out there and educating the various segments of our community uh, here in uh, Westchester. Thank you. Wafa, would you like to add uh, to that? Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I agree completely and, um, and literacy is very, very critical and um, and I think similar, I mean, it's the same lesson we're learning with COVID-19 is, is engaging um, with, um, with uh, civil society groups and community groups as a, in partnership. Um, uh, because sometimes they, they can actually reach where we cannot reach. Um, they can, they're often trusted by the communities themselves. They can translate what we're saying into probably much more coherent um, uh, language and uh, accessible language. Uh, so I, I think uh, in, if we are to focus on really getting or garnering the benefits of all these amazing discoveries, uh, these partnerships become so vitally important uh, to, to get to the next stage. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from the audience. It is, uh, can you comment on the similarity of the onset of COVID pandemic to the early years of HIV. Um, I'll start on that one. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there are lots of similarities. I, I would say, um, I, I think number one is, um, is who has been most severely affected. I mean, uh, HIV affected the most vulnerable, the most disenfranchised in our communities. And, and similarly, COVID-19, of course, shined the light on these same, these same disparities. We know when you look at the uh, effect on, uh, uh, of uh, COVID-19, uh, SARS-CoV-2 infections is that uh, what we've noticed is, for example, African-Americans tend to have much worse outcomes than others. 
we've noticed that again, if you look at outcomes, um, it's very much depends on how well, if you have a comorbid conditions, how well that's controlled. And we, we know that in some of our communities because of uh, the quality of the services they, uh, they uh, have available to them or because of access issues is that often these chronic conditions are not well managed and that makes them more vulnerable. So both HIV and COVID-19 in some ways shine the light on, on the vulnerabilities in our societies and the disparities in our societies. Um, so I think that's a, a big um, issue. I would say the second one is learning again the lesson of involvement, importance of involving communities. And uh, it took us a while in HIV. We did nothing instantaneously. Remember, the advocates had to, have to bang on the doors, you know, to be heard um, and to be respected. And with the, with the COVID response, we saw similarly. We were kind of everybody was, you know, wondering why aren't people getting tested? Why are people hesitant to get vaccinated? And you know, it, it's all about trust. It's all about working with the communities, listening to them, and um, engaging them, engaging their champions, and engaging their advocates. So I think that's kind of another lesson that's in a similarity I find between HIV and COVID uh, nineteen. I think maybe another a third aspect is 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 obviously the um, the pace of advances and 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 that's that's been very dramatic in terms of COVID nineteen when you contrast that with advances in HIV we often hold up HIV as a field where advances were happening at a rapid pace but again when you contrast that with what's happening in COVID the pace is much more rapid in COVID nineteen. And uh, people ask me, why is that the case? It, of course, it's the biology of the virus itself and uh, the ease of creating a new vaccine versus the struggles we've had to get a vaccine for HIV. Uh, but sometimes people also will say, is it because COVID-19 can affect everybody versus HIV affected some? And whether that, uh, that in some way also implicitly drove the willingness to put in the resources and so on into tackling COVID versus HIV. Dial? Thank you, Dial. Yeah, I, I would mention, I would agree with everything that Wafa has, has said. Uh, one of the other places where I think there is a striking similarity is the segments of our population who are unwilling to accept uh, treatment. Uh, and early on, uh, certain segments of our population, even though we had treatment available, were unwilling to accept that treatment. Uh, the same is true for uh, services related to prevention. And if we look at COVID, we have a similar situation where we have a segment of our population that are unwilling to accept uh, vaccination. And so we have to work very hard to figure out how we're going to get to that segment. One of the other things which I think is a parallel with HIV and also with COVID is the fueling of the pandemic in both cases by mass incarceration. And so we know that a lot of people come out of our correctional facilities and they take, they bring HIV back to the community. And the same has been true with COVID. Uh, the main difference has been the rapidity with which infection has been spread, uh, but the end result can be uh, equally devastating. And so these are things that we have to work on uh, very, 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 very hard over the next uh, several months and years. Very good point. Thank you. We have another question here. Uh, this one is from a uh, doctor. Uh, my patient, uh, patients of mine refer uh, to uh, lots of similarities, especially in the sentence of death. You know, can you speak to, to this? I think they're talking about the similarities between uh, COVID and HIV. And this is from uh, Dr. Maria Claudia Stockler de Almedia. Sentence of death. I'll, I'll say one, one thing and uh, it's just very briefly. I think that now most of us feel that uh, if we are able to catch the patients early enough with HIV, uh, then this is no longer a death sentence as it was back in the early 1980s when we were seeing the people at the tip of the iceberg who were the sickest people, 
we couldn't really uh, help. Uh, now, if people are diagnosed early and if they avail themselves to treatment, we can successfully manage them. Uh, with COVID, we do have a similar situation. If people take the vaccine, they are not going to get seriously ill most of the time. And they can be prevented from uh, dying, even if they have more underlying morbidities. We know that we're starting to see a lot of breakthrough infections now with the Omicron variant. But fortunately, we're not seeing people uh, who have been fully vaccinated. We're not seeing these people dying. So we are seeing the death sentence, but it has been confined to those individuals who have decided for whatever reason that they don't want to be vaccinated. Yes, absolutely. And just to add as well, um, maybe the relevance of early diagnosis applies to both. Um, clearly, it's tragic when we get that patient with HIV who comes in with cryptococcal meningitis or you know, evidence of advanced disease. And that urges us as much as possible to do this work to be able to get people to get tested and frequently tested if they are at risk for HIV. And it's similar for COVID. I think the, uh, we're beginning to see an evolution now is that early diagnosis for people who have symptoms, again, the use of testing is very important. And early diagnosis offers people um, the opportunity to also get now some of the treatments that are available. Because as we, we know that now the evidence shows that for several treatments, whether they be monoclonal antibodies or some of the new antivirals that look promising, is that the earlier that you get treated, the better your outcome is going to be. So that's kind of another similarity uh, between um, HIV and COVID. And, and therefore, it does not need to obviously be a death sentence. Right. Thank you. The next question we have is from uh, Dr. Olade uh, Akande. Uh, question on top of my mind today is how to help a segment of the population who refuse treatment. Can the panelists share any best strategies to help patients who refuse ARVs, antiretrovirals? This has always been difficult. I can just share with you my experiences, which wouldn't I, had a, uh, a, a part-time practice and also in the hospital uh, when we were treating HIV patients, I would try to understand exactly what the person's uh, concerns were about treatment and try to explain to them the benefits of treatment. I would basically try to tell them that if they were my sister or my brother or my uncle or my aunt, that I would recommend that they be treated. That's the, that would be the kind of uh, recommendation that I would give to them. But I would try to make sure that I addressed all of the questions and concerns that they had. I would try to avoid at all costs being in any way judgmental. Uh, I would try to understand why it was that they didn't feel that they should take the treatment. And I would just try my best to uh, give them as much objective information as possible. Sometimes this would work. Other times it wouldn't. Uh, sometimes getting the trusted messenger involved, uh, another person who might be under treatment to have them talk with that person. And this is where some of the, uh, the group sessions are, are an advantage where uh, the doctors may not be able to convince another person, but someone who is from their community who they trust, uh, who is also on treatment, that can sometimes be very helpful. Yeah, I, I agree with them. It's kind of, it's, that question is always reminds me of the question I'm asked every day now is how do you convince somebody who's refusing vaccines uh, to get vaccinated? And uh, because it's, the response is quite similar. There is no magic one sentence or something that would work for everybody. And as Daya was saying, it requires listening very carefully um, to why, uh, why is the person refusing treatment um, and or refusing a vaccine? And trying to, you know, respond, to, you know, give them the information back if they have misinformation or disinformation to give them the right, you know, the right information. It also means being relentless, never giving up, uh, 
and uh, because it's, uh, I mean, I'm sure Bayer has had the same experience where yes. he struggled with patient after, you know, where I remember vividly a woman that I took care of who treatment for, for years as I watched her develop progressive HIV tragically. And then it, you know, it's kind of was actually the nurse in the clinic who convinced her. It wasn't me. It was a, a nurse who, you know, she developed a close relationship with that was able to convince her. And this brings back the same idea of using the team, thinking of all the people that may be more trusted by the individual patient, maybe the, that they are more likely to listen to. And, and like I said, never giving up, always keeping that conversation alive. Well, thank you to uh, both of you. It looks like we're coming up on time. We have uh, time for one more question. Uh, I'll look in the in the chat here. Uh, just as we're we're waiting for that last question, I uh, want to thank everyone for participating today. Uh, whether you're uh, uh, watching us live or if you're watching the recording of this in the future, uh, the IDSA Foundation. Uh, plans to do uh, additional uh, conversations like this, uh, which we call the John 